Great. So uh, just picture a six-year-old boy um, just graduating from um, the sixth grade, actually, and uh, being asked the question, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I certainly remember that as if it was yesterday when that question was asked of me. And of course, I wanted to be either a doctor, or really wanted to be a doctor, wanted to be um, a professor, really wanted to be a professor. Um, I even went as far as to say that um, I wanted to be a, uh, a baseball player because I was really good at baseball during that time. And so uh, when asked that question, very few of us would say, even at this stage of our lives, that I want to be, I want to grow up to be a drug addict, or I want to grow up to be gay. That's usually not the discourse that happens at this stage of one's life. But uh, as we all know, uh, life shows up, and it oftentimes shows up without our permission. Storms arise. And certainly, even though my hopes and dreams were really, really expansive, life got in the way, such that uh, in 1980, uh, I became the victim of what I'm teaching about, what I've experienced um, in terms of substance use disorder. So in 19, uh, between 1980 and 1990, you would have seen me in Los Angeles, California, uh, succumbing to a very, very dilapidated substance use disorder, addiction. Uh, addicted to crystal meth, addicted, addicted to crack cocaine, such that it took me down such a dark path where I was homeless, where on any given night, you would have seen me sleeping under a tree in a park in West Hollywood because I had nowhere else to go. No relationships got to a point of complete and total desperation. And it wasn't until somebody, when I was down as low as I possibly could get, reached down, touched my hand, and I want to thank Carl Bean uh, to this day for doing that, but reached down, touched my hand, and told me, uh, young man, you do not have to live like that. And ever since that day, um, things have been different for me. Um, this coming August, I actually will be celebrating 29 years of continuous recovery, continuous clean time. But the journey was a, uh, a journey that sometimes when I look back on it, I actually just, you know, I just shudder because um, I just never thought I would make it to see you this day. So I say all that to say that the lens that I am uh, coming to you with uh, in this presentation, Health Disparities Among Black Gay Men at the Intersection of Race and Substance Use Disorder is a lens that I come through professionally as a professor and having done research in this area. And in fact, my dissertation was why do, um, how black men who have sex with men learn how to cope with homophobia and racism. That was my doctoral dissertation. But also, I come to you from a lens of experience, of having been in the trenches, of having uh, experienced some of the sort of most catastrophic things that could happen to a human being. And that's the lens that I will be doing this presentation. And part of my goal is just to be as transparent as I possibly can. So you could ask me any questions toward the end that you want to ask. And what I've come to understand is all of the pain, all of the agony that I've gone through has prepared me for exactly what it is that I'm doing uh, today. So um, let's uh, talk about our objectives. So what we're gonna discuss today. So we wanna look at um, identity factors related to substance use disorder in the black gay community. So issues around identity, sexual orientation, that kind of thing. We also want to explore issues related to race and homophobia in the Black gay community and in the Black community overall. We want to look at health disparities among Black gay men, particularly 
as our community has been impacted by COVID-19 uh, disproportionately. It also has been impacted by HIV and AIDS disproportionately. So we're going to talk about some of those disparities. Um, we'll also talk about what some of the treatment st uh, strategies are and what mechanisms we can do to actually address the problem, to solve the problem. And lastly, what are some of the action steps that we can uh, take as healthcare professionals, as counselors, nurses, whatever your profession is, this will allow you to have some additional information in order to be more responsive to your population, in order to be more helpful, and at the end of the day, uh, to be more caring and from a perspective of cultural, what we call cultural humility. So what does that mean? That means that what we're learning today is just not a one-time effort. What we're learning today is perhaps the beginning of a lifelong ongoing um, attempt to continuously educate ourselves about communities who are different than we are and making that commitment to do that. So let's talk a little bit about language. And I know oftentimes I hear people say, you know, if there's another letter uh, in this LGBT, I don't know what I'm going to do. But let's just make sure we understand what these acronyms mean. So the L stands for lesbian. Those are uh, women who are attracted to other women. Uh, gay, that's sort of a loose term. Oftentimes that refers to uh, an individual who has an attraction for the same sex. Not at, let's just put this in perspective. Not everybody identifies with these terms. And we'll talk a little bit about how uh, we can address that. Uh, bisexual, uh, and that is individuals who are attracted to both sexes. We have a transgender, and that um, is an individual whose identity is different than what they were born, than the sex that they were born. Uh, queer is sort of a loose term uh, that uh, has been used to sort of, uh, sort of an umbrella term. Uh, to uh, talk about one's sexuality, one's sexual orientation as being for the same sex. Again, not everybody um, sort of subscribes to these kinds of um, uh, uh, identifications. And it also takes a different connotation, for example, when a heterosexual person actually calls a, 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 a same gender loving person Queer. So that term is, uh, you know, used, you know, there's a lot of flexibility there. Then the term other. So there are some identifications that um, just may be different than the normal discourse um, talks about. So, for example, one may identify as two spirited, one may identify as intersex. So, so that other uh, actually sort of encompasses that. And the plus sign is. Uh, what other kinds of identities that individuals have that, you know, may or may not be part of um, the, uh, the normal kind of discourse. MSM, men who have sex with men, is a term that scientists basically use to, in their research, in their identification of men who are attracted to uh, men. Same gender loving. So let's talk a little bit about that. Because again, everybody does not subscribe to uh, gay, uh, queer, those kinds of things. So as African-Americans uh, who've experienced uh, significant oppression, not just from the majority community, but also within the gay community as well, don't always subscribe to the term gay. And so oftentimes in my research, particularly, um, this term came up in the 90s by um, a researcher by the name of Cleo Menango, uh, who uh, sort of coined the term same gender loving. And many African Americans uh, use that term, gay African Americans use that term uh, in order to identify themselves with loving someone of the same gender, as opposed to a man who just has sex with other men. And so you'll see that term oftentimes in um, the, uh, the Black uh, 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 same gender loving literature. Also, cisgender is an individual uh, who is um, assigned or who identifies with the sex that they were assigned 
at birth. And so again, as we move through the presentation, uh, we want to contextualize uh, what we're talking about and understand what we mean uh, in, in these terms. Now, a lot of research I've done also, many particularly African-American men do not identify with any of these. Uh, they say, I don't, I don't wear labels, do not define me as a label, and that's all right. That's all right. Um, oftentimes, particularly, um, again, I've worked in healthcare for many, many, many years. Um, we may not know what to call somebody. We may not, you know, we don't, we may not know if they're lesbian, if they're gay, or whatever. So, what we want to do most times is ask people what they would like, how they would like to be addressed. And that way, there's no mistaking in terms of us being disrespectful uh, to those individuals as we uh, interact with them. So uh, in terms of substance use, the, the main substances, particularly when we're talking about um, the, and I'm just gonna, you know, for all intents and purposes, uh, use the term gay uh, for the gay community. But cocaine, crystal meth, as well as opioids, we'll be looking at these three particular substances and how they intertwine within the gay community, as well as separating them culturally in terms of what communities may uh, be more apt to use one drug as opposed to the other. But the, the three main ones, cocaine, crystal meth, uh, as well as opioids. So let's start off with opioids. Again, I had the privilege to be able to set up, uh, to help facilitate a statewide strategic plan for the opioid and prescription drug overdose epidemic. And so um, in terms of what they are, uh, in terms of definition, and the CDC says that prescription opioids can be used to treat moderate to severe pain and are often prescribed following some kind of surgery, some kind of injury, whether it be acute or chronic. Here is the problem. Anyone who takes prescription opioids can become addicted to them and it does not have to take years in order for that to happen. Anybody, anybody can become addicted. Now, certainly, when we go to the doctor and they, for example, we go and get our wisdom tooth removed and the doctor in the nineties, this is what was happening. And in and, and, uh, uh, and 2000, we could be prescribed uh, 90 days worth of Oxycontin, 90 days. So, you know, you're talking uh, massive amounts of opioids. But what we were told during that time is that these were safe and they were not addicted. So um, that is uh, part of the problem in how we've gotten to the point that we've gotten to in terms of the opioid epidemic being uh, described as a national public health emergency. That's what the former president noted in terms of opioids. And we'll talk a little bit about that and you know, um, issues around race with that, issues around um, you know, uh, which populations uh, uh, get what kinds of services and what kind of responses. So just to contextualize this, opioids, uh, when we think about opioids, we think about Oxycontin is the number one most abused uh, opioid. So we've got Vicodin, morphine, methadone, codeine, Percocet, but here is, probably the worst culprit that there is that has put us into the, um, the, the, the situation that we're in now with overdose death, and that is fentanyl. Fentanyl is from 50 to 100 times more potent than morphine. And why I'm actually uh, harping on this, and we'll see in some of the, uh, the subsequent slides, how most of the deaths that are happening in our community now, even as a result of the uh, pandemic, fentanyl is the culprit. And what happens is that unbeknownst to uh, the person using uh, fentanyl, 
they're not always aware that their particular drug has been laced with fentanyl. And that's how uh, most of our overdoses have happened. So for example, heroin users. So, you know, uh, fentanyl sort of mimics opioids. And so in an effort to be more profitable, uh, dealers are lacing morphine, I mean, lacing um, uh, uh, heroin with uh, fentanyl. And because it's very difficult to measure in terms of the measuring equipment that many of uh, the dealers use, they're not even always aware of how much they're actually putting in the drug. And so that's how oftentimes persons become um, uh, persons overdose. Now, here is also the other problem. It's not just heroin that's being mixed with fentanyl. It's marijuana. It is cocaine. It is crystal meth. It is oxycodone. It is hydrocodone. Many of these things are mixed with fentanyl, which is causing the problems. You see it very clearly in one of the films coming uh, 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 slides coming up. Car fentanyl. Carfentanil is even stronger than fentanyl, if you can imagine. Actually, carfentanil is used as an elephant tranquilizer, but they are lacing drugs with carfentanil as well as fentanyl. So carfentanil is just sort of a different analog to fentanyl, but it's much, much, much stronger. And of course, um, heroin um, is also uh, an opioid uh, as well. So moving right on along. So let's look at overdose deaths in the US. Just, just, just sort of you know, keeping things in context. So uh, nearly 841,000 people have died since 1999. And in 20, just in 2019 alone, se almost 71,000 people overdosed uh, occurred in the United States. Of those overdoses, of those overdose, 70% of the nearly 71,000 were from an opioid. And the culprit, fentanyl. Most often, the culprit is fentanyl. So uh, let's look, so, so, so those are opioids. Let's look at stimulants. Because when we're talking about the, the gay community, the gay community oftentimes disproportionately uses stimulants compared to the general population. So um, let's, let's first talk about cocaine. And so uh, cocaine is a, a powerful addicted stimulant uh, made from the cocoa leaf. And uh, it has some medical use, uh, particularly um, uh, analogs of it like lidocaine, uh, oftentimes used when you go to the dentist and they stick the needles uh, in your gum. That's just usually um, lidocaine. But for all intensive purposes, cocaine is used as a recreational drug because it makes one feel good. It gives you a sense of euphoria. Uh, what it does is it overstimulates your dopamine receptors in the brain. And ultimately, after long term use, actually causes them to overstimulate and malfunction. And so, um, you know, again, long-term uh, use of, of cocaine, and, and for some even short-term uh, use of cocaine, is very, very addictive. And so um, one form of, co of co cocaine, of course, is cocaine powder. Another form of cocaine, mostly uh, uh, oftentimes associated with, with Blacks, is crack cocaine. And so crack cocaine is powder cocaine that has been uh, changed into a rock hard formation. And so one just you know boils it uh, in water and adds a couple of chemicals. One of them is baking soda. And um, after a few moments of boiling, it then turns into a rock from which one can smoke. And you can see the smoking pipe. So let me just also tell, uh, tell you this, that sure, the drug is most of the thing that allows uh, individuals to become addicted. However, it's also um, these other kinds of psychological things that happen. So when you see this pipe, you'll see inside, you'll see a white cloud. 
oftentimes we say in recovery, you know, part of addiction is the finding, the using, and finding ways and means to get more. So it's it, it's not just the drug, it's the whole sort of um, behavior that goes along with it. And part of what gets people addicted as well is that smoke and just watching it, expecting it. And this becomes part of the psychological drama that happens when we use um, uh, cocaine and uh, when we, and uh, especially when we smoke it. Now, one thing about crack cocaine is uh, compared to, uh, let's say, crystal meth or methamphetamine is the high lasts for very short periods of time, um, somewhere around 15, 20 minutes, which means that individuals have to continuously go back and get more, continuously. And this could go on for hours and hours and hours. And ultimately, crack is cheaper than regular cocaine. But if you continuously have to go back and get more and more and more, it then becomes very, very um, expensive. Now, again, uh, crack cocaine is mostly associated with um, African-American men, usually over the age of 30. So what are the risks of cocaine, of cocaine in particular? One thing is that it accelerates HIV infection. And so it actually causes the increase in the replication of a T cell uh, within uh, your, uh, your, your blood system. Uh, it impairs the immune system or immune cells. Uh, it also, um, or, or, or it also it promotes the replication of the HIV virus within the system. And uh, other things, particularly if one is uh, injecting cocaine, uh, is that it also causes increased risk in terms of hepatitis C, other diseases um, like endocarditis, which is an, an infection of the lining of the heart, very serious. Those individuals have to have open heart surgery in order to correct it. And of course, HIV and those associated behaviors that puts one at increased risk uh, for HIV as well. So let's look at methamphetamine. Methamphetamines is a very, very highly addictive stimulant that affects the central nervous system. So other uh, terms that are used that um, are associated with crystal meth, um, the term ice, the term chalk, the term meth, the term crystal, the term speed, and the term crank. These are all terms or street terms that are associated with uh, crystal uh, or methamphetamine. Oftentimes methamphetamine like cocaine uh, can be dissolved in water and injected. Of course, we know when uh, one injects these uh, chemicals, the high is much quicker and is much more intense. But there's also, again, much more associated risk in terms of injecting. Uh, and, you know, uh, because of the uh, pandemic and the increase in substance use as a result of the pandemic, um, as well as the opioid epidemic, we've seen an escalation of HIV that's directly associated with the use, the increase use of uh, substances. So how is it ingested? It can be smoked, very similar to um, cocaine. Uh, it also can be swallowed. Uh, it can be put in beverages and it also can be uh, snorted. What are some of the other health risks? And so this is, you know, a very, very powerful picture just in terms of the health risk that are associated with uh, crystal meth particularly, or methamphetamine, it literally destroys your mouth. Uh, and looking at the teeth and gums, uh, they are just literally destroyed. Um, when it's injected particularly, increased risk for HIV and AIDS, and we talked about endocarditis, but the neurological damage, particularly from meth, uh, can be very, very chronic and long lasting, even a year after one stops using crystal meth, may still experience some of the psychological damage that's been associated with the use of crystal meth. So 
crystal meth and the gay community. So because um, the gay community in terms of environment and places where uh, they congregate, um, oftentimes it's bars, um, crystal meth compared to the general population is more prevalent in the gay community. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about why that is. But uh, some of the factors that are associated with crystal meth, it basically lowers your inhibition, uh, increases self-confidence. However, uh, and I didn't mention this in the previous slide, individuals also may uh, 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 instill crystal meth directly into the rectum which causes and may cause damage to the rectal lining. But also when the rectal lining is damaged or perforated, it certainly is a conduit, a more concise conduit for HIV and hepatitis C transmission. So looking at this slide, and it's a little bit busy, but I, I thought this was important because I wanted you to get a sense of uh, what is happening now uh, compared to uh, before the epidemic. So let's just look at this uh, slide, uh, uh, the bar chart on the left, the one that says all drugs. So the light blue represents pre-COVID-19, uh, and it is drug overdose deaths before and during the pandemic by month and substance class. So we'll see uh, uh, among all drugs that uh, in each bar represents a month. So we've got from March uh, 2000 to, uh, I'm sorry, March uh, 19, all the way uh, to August of 19. And we can see that particularly uh, in August 19, that there was an increase in uh, substance use. But we were making good strides then. When you look at this next bar, and this is uh, starting in March of 20, when we really, really started to see the epidemic take off, in March, we, we, we were at fairly low levels in terms of all drugs. But look at as the months increase in April of 20, look at the trajectory. In May of 20, look at the trajectory all the way to August of 20 and a slightly dip, but the absolute prevalence of overdoses increased dramatically during the epidemic. That has grave implications for public health and individuals um, who are working in the area of substance use disorder. Now this uh, bar chart uh, at the very end looks at fentanyl. And so we can see before the epidemic, the light blue, that the levels were, were, were fairly low. But look at again, after March of 1920, where you know it was even at a fairly lower level. But starting in April, all the way through to August, look at the trajectory. And this is just fentanyl. So it's been fentanyl during the, during the pandemic that's been driving these overdose deaths, okay? And uh, again, uh, compared to the same period in 2019, March 14, 2020 to August uh, 31st, 2020, overdose deaths increased, and here it is by 58%. That's mind boggling. Fentanyl, again, just look at this number. Overdose deaths increased by 161%. We've got a problem. So why do people use meth? Um, one of the reasons, that I, and I don't think anybody really uses substances, with the intent on becoming uh, addicted to these substances. But one of the reasons, particularly in gay culture and in the gay community, it increases sex drive and sexual pleasure. So oftentimes the motivation for use is sex in nature or sexual in nature. Also weight loss. 
Uh, because of the nature of crystal uh, and, and methamphetamine, oftentimes people will stay up for days. Again, just sharing with you my personal experiences, it's not unusual to stay up for five days in a row and not eating. And so you can just imagine the physical devastation on the body. Uh, and also um, it lowers sexual inhibition. So that oftentimes individuals engage in activities that they normally would not engage in because of um, uh, having uh, ingested uh, crystal meth. So it's highly addictive, but these are some of the reasons that individuals have said uh, they use crystal meth. So let's just look at the LGBT community overall. Compared with the general population, gay and bisexual men, lesbians, and transgender individuals are more likely to use alcohol. Remember I told you that the bar culture is very pervasive within the gay community. And so it's in that culture that oftentimes um, these drugs are sort of disseminated as well as um, alcohol use. Um, and again, compared to the general population, have a higher rate of substance use and also continue heavy drinking into later life. So let's just look at the, the hidden crisis because when we look at the national discourse, so for example, opioids. So when we really talk about opioids, we really think about opioids as being um, a problem in white suburban uh, middle-class individuals. You rarely hear about Blacks and the opioid epidemic. However, if we didn't learn anything else from the HIV AIDS epidemic, when we um, uh, uh, eliminate or, or silence or don't address uh, this issue in all communities, ultimately the face will change. And so we know today, back in the early 80s, the face of HIV AIDS were white gay men. So how is it that uh, 40 years later that the face of HIV AIDS are African-American gay men and African-Americans African overall. So let's look at the issue of stigma. And so for, for Blacks, uh, uh, when we talk about the war on drugs, illicit drug use is viewed more as a criminal activity and the solution for many is many, many, many years uh, behind bars uh, as a solution to the problem. The so-called war on drugs that was sort of initiated by Nixon, uh, sort of perpetuated um, by uh, 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 Clinton uh, in terms of the three strikes you're out. And so there are many, many African-American men particularly who are languishing in jail because either they had small amounts of um, drugs or um, they were uh, just um, addicted or carrying uh, some kind of equipment that was associated with drugs. On the other hand, with the opioid epidemic that's now uh, described as a public health emergency. So if something is a public health emergency, that means it warrants not jail, but it warrants resources. It warrants treatment. It warrants empathy. It warrants compassion. And when you listen to the news, you hear a whole different kind of conversation around the opioid epidemic versus the crack epidemic or even the heroin epidemic among African-Americans back in the 70s. So, fear, so a stigma is um, a very, very real element in terms of what Black gay men have to deal with. Uh, and the other thing that many people often don't talk about is the the discrimination. So, so black gay men um, sort of experience discrimination, homophobia from, from three lens. So from the majority culture, um, also from within the black community in terms of homophobia. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. But um, uh, particularly uh, as much of this stems from the uh, the rhetoric uh, from the Black church in terms of um, uh, 
uh, uh, homosexuality, as, as they were called, or being gay. So, so these are, are, are the sort of the, the, the oppressive umbrella that Black gay men um, have to uh, deal with. And again, um, the whole idea of fear of arrest, the stigma, uh, feeling of, of guilt and, and low self-esteem oftentimes uh, prevents this population from receiving the kind of uh, care and treatment that they need in order to deal with their problem and um, ultimately places them at greater risk for HIV. So let's look at continually racism within the gay community. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that, but also homophobia within uh, the black community. And uh, this clip uh, that I'm about to show you uh, really sort of examines uh, this whole notion of homophobia within the black community. Uh, and uh, during the time in 1982, when HIV AIDS was rampant in the black gay community and the kinds of things that we had to deal with, literally going to a funeral almost every other day. Many of our, of our friends, close friends were dying. It just was something that you had to be there to experience it. And um, oftentimes the, the, the black community sort of um, uh, uh, pushed aside uh, many of uh, black gay men who had to die in silence, had to, who had to die alone. Um, and I was there during that time. And oftentimes the church would not funeralize uh, many of these uh, individuals. Uh, many family members, once they found that they were uh, HIV, then associated them with being gay and many of them disassociated themselves with family. So many of our, our black gay brothers actually died alone. Um, and, and at that time, again, I lived in Los Angeles, California, and I literally can say I left California in 1979. I went back in 1980, uh, 1982. When I went back, literally 90% of my friends had died, 90%. And so it was a very catastrophic time in terms of the Black community. So let's just watch this video. Hopefully it'll come up for everybody. Yep, we see it. And just to remind you guys, uh, I'm a loyal customer okay. here out with my girlfriends, and we're having just the darndest time trying to relax into this peaceful summer evening. And what is it that we can do for you? There's nothing peaceful about your grating voices, cackling so loudly we can't even hear our own conversation. Electra, do not do it. This one right here is not worth it. I don't think that my girlfriends and I are any louder than these other tables. Why don't you be frank with us? What exactly is it that you're trying to say? I'm no dummy. I work in the city, and I know a man pretending to be a woman when I see one, and I see three right in front of me. This is not that kind of establishment. Wait a minute. Girl. God may have blessed you with Barbies, a backyard with a pony in it, a boyfriend named Jake, and an unwanted pregnancy that your father paid to terminate so you could go to college and major in being a basic bitch. None of these things make you a woman. Mm -hmm. Clear your throat. Lubricate. Mm -hmm. Read that bitch. Your uniform of ill-fitting J. Crew culottes, fake pearls, and 50 cent crunchies cannot conceal the fact that you do not know who you are. Mm -hmm. I know our presence threatens you. We fought for our place at this table, and that has made us stronger than you will ever be. Now pick your jaw off the floor and go back to your clam chowder and shallow conversations. My girlfriends and I aren't going anywhere. It was lovely talking to you. Y'all heard that? Go get your clam chowder. The clam chowder gets you. <laughs> Should we order another round? Yes. Shit. And then you should be able to exit out and the presentation should pop back up. And then don't forget, um, we do have the minty still, if you still want to do it out of that. Okay, great. So uh, I wanted to make sure that you all see this clip because it really um, sort of um, shows a, a new sort of examination 
of Black gay culture, particularly the ballroom scene that this um, series posed has shown. And it really brings the HIV AIDS epidemic, what uh, we had to go through as Black gay men. It really brings it front and center in a very, very poignant way like I've never seen before. And I tell you, I was watching this one day and literally I was in tears because so much of what this particular series talks about it are exactly what we went through. And the entire cast is gay. Um, and a great representation of transgenders as well and the journey that they have to take. So um, I, I really think that uh, this helps people be more compassionate, helps them be more understanding in terms of um, being able uh, to identify with and work with the, um, the Black gay community. So um, again, uh, when we're uh, talking about uh, cultural differences in terms of um, substance use, again, crack cocaine users are predominantly black men. And when compared to methamphetamines, which are mostly white and mostly used by white gay men. But here is the problem. Dr. Bryant, you're still on the, um, you're still on the, um slide with the, well, not the slide, but the uh, YouTube video. I'm still on the YouTube yep, video? Yeah, I can see it. We can see it now. You see it now? Yep. Okay, good. So um, although when we talk about prevalence, methamphetamine use is higher in the white gay community, but again, just like cocaine and other substances, it's slowly seeping into the black gay community through um, a lot of different mechanisms. One of those mechanisms is just the association between black gay men and white gay men. So oftentimes um, uh, they party together, they have sex together, they interact together. And so the um, proliferation of crystal meth into the black gay, uh, gay community, one of the mechanisms is through white gay men. Um, another mechanism, you'll see that um, I think in this, in this next slide, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so in this slide, so um, there are dating apps. The dating scene and how we have sex have changed dramatically with social media. So you've got these apps that are used by both black gay men and white gay men. And I tell you, you've got an app, one is called Jacked. Another one's called Adam for Avon. Adam, and that's that, we see that four and the orange. And there are other apps too, Grinder. Those are three of the popular ones. And so here you can literally um, open the app up and each specs from individuals are very, very clear. You know, what role they play sexually, how tall they are, how much they wear, all of these things. And you literally can click on and um, have a conversation or interaction with that individual. But here's the other thing. There are codes. There are languages that are used within these apps that have nothing to do with, well, that indirectly something to do with sex, but where uh, crystal meth and where other drugs are actually communicated and marketed through these mechanisms. So for example, you can look on, let's say a person's um, specs or the specification, and they'll give you their, their age and their, you know, uh, what they like, what they don't, a little bit about themselves. But they also have um, these sort of um, abbreviations. One of them is P4P, uh, a, a party for play. And that's uh, another sort of um, acronym for crystal meth. So they've got this language that's, you know, that we all have to try and decode but what it's saying is, I'm an individual, I want a sexual experience, but I want it through uh, by using crystal meth. And so that's just another avenue where these individuals actually um, uh, are using uh, a crystal meth, but also finding other people who want the same thing. So in a sample uh, that was done in New York, uh, 95%, and this, is, uh, this was used in the last 30 days, 95% reporting, this is African-Americans, 
94, 95% re reported meth use in the last 30 days, which to me means that meth use in the black gay community continues to rise. And we're not having this conversation about resources and about recovery associated with meth use in the black um, uh, gay community. And also another sort of um, term that's used uh, in some of these apps, uh, sex for pay. So that means it may be sex for pay or sex for drugs. And so again, these are the ways oftentimes that um, drug use and uh, drug interactions are actually uh, communicated. So uh, in, again, in terms of HIV and AIDS, I wanted to show this clip because this really shows, um, again, a scene from Pose, but it really shows the devastation of individuals um, who were dying on a daily basis. But one of the things that this show sort of um, illuminates is the ball culture and how because of this external oppression, we had to find mechanisms. We had to find people that will protect us, that would love us. And a lot of that happened within the ball community. And so they really, really focus on that in this show and, and, and what role that it played in uh, maintaining uh, and actually um, allowing particularly young black gay men uh, to have um, a safe place to stay, as well as um, individuals uh, that would be that would be concerned about them. So he knows we love him. Do any of you remember the pixie ball? Didn't he walk sex hour and wear nothing but pink glitter and a thong? Yeah. <laughs> I admired his nerve. And when he told me he walked all the way from his apartment to the ball in that outfit, I knew he needed a mother to teach him about survival. Kobe didn't care what anybody had to say about him. He never apologized for who he was. We used to fight and argue all the time. I thought he acted the way he did because he wanted to upset me. He never considered it was just who he was. I regret letting my own ignorance drive him away from me. Listen, nobody is out here teaching parents how to accept their gay children. You can't blame yourself for what you didn't know. Thank you. Thank you for taking care of my boy. I'm sorry I gave up on you. I'm sorry I let you go. I'm so sorry I let you go. Yo, yo, we need some help. That's no, okay, Pappy. There's nothing we can do. He's going. Okay, can you see the my PowerPoints now? Yep, we can see them. Yeah. So, so that was the scene. That was the scene that made me cry because that scenario happened all too often. But I think the message here is that how this community galvanized, how they had to help each other. And you know, I, I just will will have nothing but accolades. And, and, and honor for Carl Bean, Bishop Carl Bean, actually, um, who uh, started uh, the first hospice for Black gay men in Los Angeles, California, uh, started the, the first uh, a, a church that was affirming uh, for Black gay men in Los Angeles, because we had nothing else. Oftentimes, you cannot go to the, our church 
and you know talk about our issues and our problems. So um, as a community, uh, we really did galvanize um, during this very very difficult period. So let's talk a little bit about more about HIV. And so when we look at health disparities and uh, what community is most impacted by HIV, it's very obvious that um, African Americans are. So this light blue represents African Americans and uh, the green represents whites. And just look at the, the disparity, 42% and this is new HIV diagnosis in the US in 2018. So the question then becomes, why is, are we still seeing these new cases 40 years after the epidemic? Um, so um, again, uh, our resources and our focus really has to be where we are actually addressing some of the issues that are prevalent within the black gay community so that, um, uh, they can get the resources that they need. And again, this just, so, so we talked, talked about the, the Black community, but here when we look at new HIV diagnosis in the U.S. in terms of affected population, this first bar chart, that's uh, Black men have sex with men. So overall, when we look at the HIV AIDS epidemic, the face is Black gay men. The question that we have to ask ourselves, how did it go from white gay men to uh, black gay men and what happened in between uh, that sort of perpetuated uh, this trajectory. So time for action. So I don't like to give a presentation without giving some resources, without us um, taking this opportunity to self-reflect, you know, on how we can allow ourselves to be catalysts for change for um, our community, but particularly these under this underserved uh, community. Firstly, let's look at language. And you know, ATTC I think does a wonderful job. They have on their website. I just pulled this right from their website. In terms of language, language is very, very important in terms of how we address, how we talk about substance use. So I just highlighted a few areas. So when we talk about stigmatized language versus preferred language. So for example, a stigmatized language would be abuser. Preferred language, a person with or suffering from a substance use disorder. So um, we um, can begin to change our language, which makes a big difference in how people feel and the respect that it shows um, to individuals that um, have substance use disorder. Another one, addict persons with a substance use disorder instead of the term addict. Now, if a person decides that that's what they want to call themselves, that's fine. But uh, in terms of our interaction and our work with this population or any population where we're working in substance use, um, we, we want to use this preferred uh, language. Um, alcoholic, instead of calling someone an alcoholic, person with an alcohol use disorder. Um, and oftentimes, uh, and I, I myself use this term clean all the time, but a different language uh, uh, could be uh, obstinate. Uh, stigmatizing language, crack babies. Preferred language, substance exposed infants. Stigmatizing language, drug habit, preferred or affirming language, regular substance use. And you can see uh, the rest of it here. And uh, again, ATTC has a wonderful website that really, really even expands further in terms of some of the language uh, that is the preferred language in terms of um, our work in substance use uh, disorder. So uh, what are treatments that are effective, you know, in terms of, um, population, so we, the, the gay population. So that's uh, one of the areas and one of the treatments uh, is cognitive behavioral therapy. Another one is um, uh, medication assisted treatment that basically is used for opioids. And so in terms of medication treatments, uh, medication assisted treatments really are the only sort of medication treatment for substance use disorder. Um, for other um, uh, substances like stimulants, 
the preferred treatment until we find medication or something better is behavioral therapy. And also naloxone, um, and, and this is a, a treatment actually for uh, individuals who have had an overdose. And so naloxone, and as a respiratory therapist, we see this all the time as patients who have overdose coming to the emergency department and are not breathing, when we give them naloxone, it's almost like the dead has arisen. And uh, it really, really does um, sort of bring these individuals to life. However, the thing is, it needs to be in the hands of the right people. It needs to be where these overdoses happen most often. And so um, that's one of the areas I think of improvement that uh, we really need uh, in terms of naloxone distribution. Uh, dis distribution. And also 12-step programs. And uh, so uh, these are uh, lifelong programs that really support and help uh, individuals to recover um, their recommendation and, and suggestion is toward obstinance. But we also know that oftentimes you have to meet people where they are. And so uh, I just want to make one thing clear about these 12-step programs. They don't kick anybody out because you're not obstinate. No, but they, 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 they sort of encourage that somewhere along the line that the ultimate long-term goal will be obstinate. But again, when we're talking about um, risk reduction, uh, we, we, we really you know, look at uh, meeting these uh, uh, patients uh, or, or individuals uh, where they are, or risk reduction or harm reduction uh, where they are. But I, I just want, want to say that it's been the 12-step program in terms of my recovery journey that's most impacted my life. And I tell you, I have not seen such miracles happen over the years. And I'm talking about like over 30 years that I've been associated. And um, nothing is just more enlightening and more invigorating than going to a, a, a convention, a world convention of one of these 12-step uh, programs and to see millions of people from all over the world. Like these 12-step programs are in almost every country, but they all, um, uh, 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 once every other year, I think it is, come together and through a convention. And I tell you the exuberance and, and the joy that's shared uh, is just uh, mind boggling. So uh, this is a slide that I actually pulled from the ATTC. And uh, this really, when we talk about behavioral cognitive therapy, we're really talking about incorporating the experiences, the environment, sort of the lifestyle of, uh, uh, of gay men. So for example, uh, in working in terms, and one thing about behavioral therapy, uh, what it tries to do is to um, identify coping mechanisms for the individual so that they can live a life that's more focused on health and wellness and developing you know, uh, coping skills. And so within this uh, gay-specific behavioral therapy intervention, uh, one has to include the gay culture, you know, bars, clubs, social and sexual contexts. Um, also uh, identify and learn about gay identity. Um, also, uh, the stigmas, uh, uh, internalized homophobia, these other kinds of issues that are more specific to, uh, to gay men. Also looking at uh, some of the, the things that I share with you in terms of gay sex and, and, and the, how uh, individuals are dating now and, 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 and the dating apps and you know, sort of that culture around um, interacting sexually with one another. And oftentimes, again, uh, some of these uh, cultural kinds of things are very clandestine, secretive. And so really learning about that and knowing that um, really puts you at an advantage in terms of, of helping. Um, and so another um, aspect uh, is what we call minority stress model in terms of working with um, particularly Black gay men. So it offers a framework that we can understand sexual orientation disparities. 
and also identifying and working with the multiple stressors that this community faces. So for example, uh, developing coping strategies in order to deal with the stress, stigma has to be um, incorporated into uh, this model. Um, affirmation, affirming the, um, the worthiness um, of uh, these men and, and, and you know, um, encouraging them uh, and also uh, stopping homophobia, addressing it, and being able to identify it as well. And also, again, racism within um, the gay community. And so um, in talking about this racism, oftentimes what happens is Black gay men experience um, oppression and racism within the white gay community because in these spaces that I've talked about, Oftentimes, Black men, when they wanted to go into a bar or club, would be asked for three or four or five identifications in order to be able to get in. Therefore, because nobody really walks around with five pieces of identification, but these were ways that white gay establishments um, sort of discriminated against Black gay men. Uh, when the HIV AIDS epidemic first broke, one of the reasons why we had to really um, you know, have our own in terms of resources is most of the resources went to the white gay community and was not disseminated appropriately to black gay. And that's why, that's one reason why the face of, of uh, HIV has changed because much of that information and outreach did not go to uh, the black gay community. So in summary, uh, the overall, uh, Substance use overall in the gay community compared to the general, uh, general population is fairly high. And so within this population, one has to address um, the issue of substance use disorder and can um, sort of curtail our interventions to more focus on those issues and, and those um, sort of problems that Black gay men actually face. So while drug use trends again are changing, methamphetamine abuse remains high within the gay community. And if it's not addressed appropriately within the Black gay community, we will continue to see an escalation of meth use within the Black gay community. Uh, both cocaine, opioids, and methamphetamine, again, are shown to increase the risk of HIV and other infectious diseases. And uh, behavioral uh, treatments uh, actually are very, very effective given that we do not have medication uh, that really will address uh, stimulant use. And so um, one of the things uh, that I just wanna say, you know, in terms of substance use disorder and HIV, now uh, with HIV, uh, we have what we call antiretroviral therapy, which is uh, compared to the 80s and 90s, I considered miracle drug, which uh, if taken appropriately, can make an individual what we call undetectable. So what does that mean? It means that the virus in your system is so low that we cannot detect it given our normal measuring mechanism. And so we've gotten so good in terms of the efficaciousness of the medications that now we can safely say, and this is backed up by the CDC, that if an individual is undetectable, it's almost impossible to pass the virus on. Unlike what we experienced in the 80s and 90s, where if you had the virus, uh, you may have six months to a year uh, to live for, for the most part. And so um, the problem then becomes this medication, antiretroviral therapy has to be taken on time. It has to be taken as prescribed by physicians. If it's meant to be refrigerated, it has to be refrigerated. So there must be consistency and there must be a commitment for uh, that individual to take their therapy on time, because if they don't, 
If they miss dosage, they miss a week here or there, uh, they miss a, a few days, the virus then become, can become more resistant and then medications have to be changed and an individual may not tolerate the uh, additional medication the way that they did the former medication. So the question then becomes to have a conversation with the doctor as well as the patient in terms of um, if the person has a substance use disorder, are they able to manage and take their medication as prescribed? And if they don't, then there needs to be a conversation about when to start antiretroviral therapy. Uh, and uh, again, medication adherence in terms of HIV AIDS is very, very uh, important. And uh, that it is 2.15. So we got about 15 minutes for questions. So here's my uh, information. Uh, I'm part-time faculty at Kennesaw State University. I also uh, part-time faculty at Capella University. But this is my uh, calling information. Uh, and um, feel free to call me at any time uh, for any questions, uh, any kind of resources that I can help you with. Certainly feel free.